trigger warning. This episode discusses domestic abuse, so listener discretion is strongly advised. This is part two of the story Tangled Web. So if you've not listened to part one already or you need a reminder, then stop and give it a listen now and then come back to this episode. If you're all up to date, then let's continue with part two. Following Max's disappearance, Sheila and Brian became closer and closer despite the growing gossip. They began to spend more and more time together and had eventually made the decision to move to Aberdeen with Sheila's three children to start a new life together. However, while Edith watched on quietly as her daughter spent more and more time with Brian, when she found out that Sheila planned to move to Aberdeen with her children to live with Brian, Edith could stay silent no longer. Earlier in the day, on Friday the 16th of August 1968, 59-year-old Edith Watson had entered the local police station and almost collapsed. She was in such distress about what she was about to say. She told police that she strongly believed that Max was dead and that her daughter Sheila and Brian Tevendale had been involved in this. She said that the day after Max had gone missing, Sheila had said to her that she would have no more worries and that Max wouldn't be back. Edith said she had asked Sheila outright if she meant that Max was dead, to which she said Sheila had nodded. She said that Sheila had gone on to say that she had a strong man at her back, to which Edith said she asked if she meant Brian Tevendale, and Sheila again nodded. Edith said she then asked her daughter if Brian had been involved in Max's murder, to which she said Sheila nodded again. When Edith was asked why she'd come forward now, she said that Max had told her that should anything happen to him, she was to ensure that Brian Tevendale never had any contact with his children. And so, while Sheila and Brian were planning on taking the children to live in Aberdeen, Edith felt she had to put a stop to it, one way or another, even if that meant her daughter being charged with her husband's murder. Shocked by this development, the police immediately made their way to West Cairnbeg to bring Sheila in for questioning. Brian was also brought to the police station for questioning on the same day, and to the detective's surprise, Brian quickly admitted his part in the murder of Max Garvey. However, upon Brian and Sheila both appearing in court on the charge of Maxwell Garvey's murder, Sheila too decided to start talking. However, her version of events were completely different to what Brian had said. Sheila said that late on the 14th of May to early 15th of May, she had been in bed with Max when she had been woken by a man whispering for her to get up and come into the hall. The man was Brian. She said that another man she knew only as Alan was also in the hall when she got there. She said she then noticed that Brian was carrying a rifle, which was later identified as being Max's. Brian then told Sheila to go into the bathroom, which she did, and closed and locked the door. She said she then heard awful thumping noises coming from the bedroom, and then silence, before Brian knocked on the bathroom door, telling her to unlock it, and to instead stand guard at the children's bedrooms in case they came out, while Brian and his friend wrapped Max's body in a sheet. Sheila watched in shock and horror as the pair then bumped Max's body down the stairs and outside to Brian's friend Alan's waiting car, and Max's body was placed in the back of the car. Apparently, the plan was for Brian to drive Max's car to the airstrip and leave it there, and then for Brian and his friend to dispose of Max's body. However, like I said, Brian's version of events was slightly different. In his statement, he said he had received a distressed phone call from Sheila saying that she had accidentally shot Max during a fight after Max threatened her with a gun. Brian said he did go to the farmhouse and he did dispose of the body of Max, but only to help Sheila out, as Brian admitted being in love with her. Brian made no mention of his friend Alan being present, doing his best to protect him. But upon Sheila making a statement mentioning Alan being there, Brian told the police exactly who he was and where he lived. On Saturday the 17th of August, Brian then took detectives to Lauriston Castle, where Max's body was. And detectives later said that if they had not been led there directly to the location, Max's body likely would never have been found. As a youngster, Brian had spent time at Lauriston Castle and its grounds, and he knew the place like the back of his hand. He led the police to an unknown narrow tunnel and told them Max was about 20 yards or 18 metres into the tunnel under large boulders. The tunnel was so narrow and low that police officers had to crawl along it on their hands and knees, but they soon became aware of a rotting smell, 
before finding a pile of stones under which was Max's body. Following a post-mortem, it was determined that Max had died three months previously from a gunshot wound to his neck and from being hit brutally on the head. Following Wescairn Beg being searched, it was discovered that the rifle that had been used to kill Max was his own. The friend of Brian's, who Sheila said was also at the farmhouse on the night Max had been murdered, was 20-year-old Alan Peters, who was also a mechanic and worked with Brian. Alan Peters was arrested on Sunday the 18th of August 1968. 33-year-old Sheila Garvey, 22-year-old Brian Tevendale and 20-year-old Alan Peters were arrested and charged with the murder of Max Garvey. Shortly after Wendy had witnessed her mother being escorted from West Cairn Beg by the police, a family member turned up to look after the children. Wendy was distraught. Wendy's world would further be rocked when a few days later her mother was charged with her father's murder and was remanded in custody. From there on in, Wendy and her siblings were told nothing further about what was happening with their mother. They weren't allowed to see their mother and they were not aware of the sensational court case and shocking headlines that would dominate the newspapers. The children were well protected by moving them into a hotel about 70 miles or 120 kilometres away, in the hope nobody would know who they were. All of the newspapers were removed so that the children would not have to endure the horrific details that were about to be exposed about their mother and father's lives. This was particularly hard for Wendy, being the oldest sibling. The trial for the murder of Maxwell Garvey was to take place at the High Court in Aberdeen on Friday the 18th of November 1968 and it was set to be quite the show. The streets outside the High Court in Aberdeen were aligned with people, some of whom accused from the early hours of the morning, desperate to get a peek at the main players as they arrived, as well as a seat at the trial of the century. A beautiful young rich woman, her lover and the lover's friend, on trial for the murder of her wealthy, flamboyant ladies' man of a husband, where the couple's sexual exploits were devoured by all present and scandalised in the newspapers. And so the trial began with the prosecution claiming that Sheila had persuaded her lover, Brian, to murder her husband, so the pair could get married and claim Max's life insurance, worth more than £55,000, which would be just over £1 million or about $1.3 million in today's money as well as inherit Max's money, properties, land and cars. They also claimed that Alan Peters had been involved in both the murder and the disposal of Max's body. All three pleaded not guilty, with Sheila's counsel lodging a special defence that the two men had killed her husband and she had no prior knowledge of their plans, and Alan's counsel lodging a special defence that Sheila and Brian had carried out the killing and that he had simply been drawn into their tangled web. Sheila and Alan would take to the stand to tell their own version of events, but Brian did not, allowing his defence advocate to speak for him. When Sheila's mother took to the stand, she became so distraught and unwell at the very first question of do you recognise the accused that she was unable to answer this question and an ambulance had to be called. She did, however, take the stand the following day. Throughout being questioned, Edith, Sheila's mother, told of how she had seen a change in Max's behaviour, how she had been shocked when he had quite openly told of how he and Brian had been flipping a coin to decide who would sleep with her daughter. She had also been aware that Max had been physically abusive to Sheila, having seen the evidence, as well as Max having admitted to her that he regularly twisted Sheila's arm so far up her back that Sheila feared her shoulder would break. She believed that the change in Max had been due to his drink and drug habit. She also told how her daughter had confirmed to her the day after Max had gone missing that he wouldn't be back, that he was dead and that Brian Tevendale had been involved. When it was Sheila's turn on the stand, she told of how her wonderful marriage to the man she loved, Max Garvey, had turned from a fairy tale to a living nightmare. She told of how Max had drunk to excess and took drugs. She told of his unrelenting pressure on her to perform more and more sexual acts which she described as disgusting. She told of his ever-increasing violence towards her, of how she felt more and more like a possession of Max's to be used and shared. Sheila told of the awful physical, mental and sexual abuse she had endured at the hands of Max Garvey, of how she had tried to leave but had no support. And finally, she told of how she had fallen in love with Brian Tevendale. 
Sheila then told her version of what had happened on the evening of the 14th of May, 1968. She reiterated that she had absolutely no idea that Brian was planning to come to her house that evening and had absolutely no idea that he had planned to murder Max. She said she was in a state of shock and disbelief and had asked Brian if Max had suffered, to which Brian had said no. She was asked why she had continued a relationship with a man who she had known had killed her husband, the father of her children, to which she replied that she felt responsible. She had let Brian Tevendale fall in love with her and that she had vowed to protect him. Brian's version of events were read to the jury from his statement to the police, where he said that Sheila had in fact shot Max by accident and he had merely helped dispose of the body, again because he loved Sheila and would do anything for her. So far, the jury had heard differing versions of what had happened and who knew what about what had happened that night such as that it was thought that Brian had murdered Max and that Sheila knew Max was dead but hadn't been aware of Brian's plan to kill Max or that Sheila had accidentally killed Max and Brian had only helped dispose of Max's body to help her. So when it was Alan Peter's turn to take the stand, things started to get even more interesting. Alan Peters was 20 years old and had married his pregnant wife only a few weeks earlier on the 26th of July where Brian was his best man and Sheila had provided the catering. Although in Sheila's statement to the police at the time of her arrest, she said she hadn't known Alan's surname. Alan worked with Brian at the same garage, both being mechanics. He said that a few weeks before the murder, Brian had said to him that he was wanting to get rid of Max and asked Alan if he would help him. Although Alan said in court that he hadn't realised that that had meant by murdering Max. That was until the pair arrived at West Cairn Beg on the night of the 14th of May, where Alan said Sheila let both him and Brian in by the garage. He said Brian and himself then had a drink in the living room while Sheila went to check on Max. When Sheila came back to tell them that Max was sleeping and to follow her, Brian then picked up Max's own 2 2 rifle and they both followed Sheila upstairs. Alan said he was terrified at what was transpiring, but was afraid to say anything for fear of being shot himself. He said they both then went into Max's bedroom while Sheila stayed outside, and Brian then shot Max through a pillow in the head. The pair then wrapped Max's body in a sheet and placed his body in the back of Alan's car. The pair then dropped Max's car off at the airstrip, before travelling to Lauriston Castle grounds and placing Max in the tunnel and covering him with boulders. So, now the jury had more to think about. Sheila and Alan both said that Brian had shot Max, but now Alan was saying that Sheila had known exactly what was planned and she had actually let the pair into the farmhouse. Trudy Burst, Brian's sister, was next to give evidence and she told yet another version of events. Trudy said that she had spoken with Brian within hours of Max being murdered and Brian had told her that it had been Alan who had struck the first blow, apparently striking Max on the head with a steel bar. Brian told her that he was sure Max was already dead before he actually shot him. However, there was never any evidence that a steel bar had been involved, although Max was struck on the back of the neck. And this was a different story to the one Brian had told the police, saying instead that Sheila had shot Max by accident. Things were becoming more tangled and it was only to get worse. Trudy also gave more of an insight into the horrific abuse that Sheila had been receiving from Max. She said that Max was obsessed with Brian and would ask Trudy to find out all she could about the intimate details of Sheila and Brian's sex life with Max taking great pleasure from every little detail. She confirmed that Max pushed Sheila and Brian together continually. Trudy said that Max would tell her that he had more pleasure from sex from one evening with Trudy than in his whole marriage to Sheila, as well as telling Trudy that he loved Brian more than he loved Sheila. Trudy confirmed that Max would say these heartbreaking things to Sheila too. Next on the stand was Alfred, or Fred, Burse, Trudy's husband and previously a policeman. However, a strange statement was made by the defence before Fred was questioned. 
They basically said that due to legal reasons, Fred and Trudy would not be asked too many questions or be pressured too much. The reason why would soon become clear. As Max had been shot while he was lying in bed, there was a significant amount of blood splatter on the mattress. And so Brian had rolled up this mattress and taken it to Fred and Trudy's home to store briefly before Fred and Brian took it to a quarry and burnt it. Trudy then agreed that Sheila could have her and Fred's mattress from their bed and Trudy would purchase a new one, as obviously it would be too risky for Sheila to suddenly purchase a new mattress. Trudy's mattress was, however, too small to fit Sheila and Max's bed, but Sheila did her best to hide this fact by using blankets and a valance sheet. And so, when the policemen came to have a look around West Cairn Beg when Max had first gone missing, they could be forgiven for missing this detail. However, upon the house being forensically examined after finding out Max had been murdered, not only was the ill-fitting mattress discovered, but also traces of blood on the headboard and the wallpaper, which Sheila had tried to hide by moving the bed to cover the stains. It was also revealed at the trial that Fred had burnt Max's clothes and ID. So despite Fred being a policeman at the time of Max's murder, he still was happy to help cover up the crime. Fred Burst resigned from the police force shortly after Sheila and Brian were arrested. It is speculated that initially there were five people on the charge of being involved in murdering Max Garvey. Sheila, Brian, Alan, Trudy and Alfred. However, if all of the above were charged, then there would be no witnesses. And so it is believed that is why Trudy and Alfred never were charged with any crime. But can what they said in court be truly believed? Shockingly, Max's skull was also presented in court, so that it could be shown to the jury just what damage had been done to Max's brain and bone structure following being shot. The bullet had still been embedded in Max's skull when his body was found. One jury member collapsed in distress at seeing Max's skull and was removed from the jury, with it continuing with just 14 members. Eventually, 10 days after the trial began and after the closing statements, it was time for the jury to retire and decide on the verdict. On the 2nd of December 1968, Alan Peters received a verdict of not proven. This is unique to Scotland, and according to Wikipedia, it is typically used by a jury when there is a belief that the defendant is guilty, but the Crown has not provided sufficient evidence. Brian Tevendale was unanimously found guilty of Max's murder, and Sheila Garvey was found guilty of murdering Max by a majority verdict, with both being served a life sentence. Upon hearing the verdict, Sheila and Brian briefly embraced and kissed before the pair were led away to begin their sentences. While the pair did send each other love letters initially, three months into the life sentence, Sheila sent a letter to Brian saying, I have decided to have nothing more to do with you ever again. And she asked Brian to destroy all of their love letters. Brian was devastated, but it transpired that Sheila had been advised to cut off contact in order to be able to see her children, as it didn't look good if she were continuing a relationship with the murderer of the children's father. However, despite this sacrifice, Sheila never did get to see her children whilst she was in prison. Not only did Sheila not have the prospect of ever seeing her children while they were still little, but six months into her life sentence, she received word that her mother was very unwell, and sadly, she died shortly afterwards. Sheila's father had passed away by this time. Now Sheila was completely alone. No children, no lover, no mother. But also, there was no Max. During and following the trial, Sheila's children, Wendy, Angela and Lloyd, had been living with their grandmother, Edith. But upon her death, they had all been placed with a foster couple in England. However, Sheila's oldest daughter, Wendy, began to really struggle. She had endured so much in her young life. Her perceived weight issue and disappointment from her dad from such a young age, being subjected to nudist colonies while being ashamed of her body, the arguments of her parents, the change in both her father due to drink and drugs and her mother due to prescription pills, the murder of her dad, her mother being sent to prison, her grandmother dying, being placed into foster care and finally not being allowed to see her mother. But there was something even more damaging that Wendy was dealing with her guilt. Wendy had convinced herself that if she'd said something, anything, 
when she had found her mum and Brian Tevendale kissing in the living room weeks before her father had been murdered, then none of this may have happened. Her dad might not be dead. Her mum wouldn't be in jail. She wouldn't be in foster care, alone, without anyone. She believed it was all her fault. And the more she thought about this, the more she spiralled out of control. Wendy continued to have body and weight issues. Her mental health began declining. And all she really wanted was to be loved. When Wendy was 16 years old, she began working in a chemist's, who she met a boy and they began dating. She told him about her past and he accepted it, seeming to only care about Wendy, which was just what Wendy thought she needed, to be loved. The pair married when Wendy was 18 and the couple had a child three years later. However, Wendy just could not escape her past. It still tormented her and when her marriage began to fail, Wendy, no longer able to cope, left her husband and child before starting on a journey that would leave her feeling even more alone. Wendy began drinking to excess, and her mental health deteriorated even further, eventually being diagnosed with schizophrenia. Wendy sadly continued to drink to excess for quite some time, desperate to try and blot out the guilt, the overwhelming guilt of what if. Then, in 1978, Wendy began to see a glimmer of hope. Her mother, Sheila, now 43 years old, had been released from prison after serving 10 years for the murder of her husband, Max Garvey. And Wendy wanted to see her. She needed to see her. Needed to talk about what had happened with someone who was there. Her brother Lloyd had been too young at the time and her sister Angela didn't want to talk about it. She had moved on and was doing fine. And Wendy had grown apart from them. Wendy would soon realise that Sheila, her mother, wasn't going to be her saviour. She didn't want to talk about it either. It was in the past and she was looking forward. Following her release from prison, Sheila had moved to Aberdeen to run her aunt's guest house. And one of the guests staying there was David McClellan, who was from Rhodesia, now modern day Zimbabwe. And within six months of being released from prison, Sheila had married David. This marriage lasted only a couple of years, with Sheila saying that she'd only married David because she had been lonely following being released from prison. Not long after the divorce, Sheila left the guest house and Aberdeen and moved to Stonehaven, about 16 miles or 26 kilometres south of Aberdeen and about 15 miles or 24 kilometres from where she had lived with her murdered first husband, Maxwell Garvey, where she ran a bed and breakfast. Soon after moving to Stonehaven, she met and married Charles Mitchell, who was a drilling engineer and the pair remained happily married in Stonehaven until December 1992, when sadly, Charles died of a heart attack. Sheila continued to stay in Stonehaven and run the bed and breakfast following Charles' death. She never married again. In her later years, Sheila developed dementia and went to live in a nursing home. She continued to deny any knowledge of what had happened to her husband, Max, on the evening of the 14th of May, 1968, until her death in December 2014 at the age of 80. Brian Tevendale also had been released in 1978 when he was 32 years old. Whilst in prison, he struck up a relationship with a female who wrote to prisoners and the pair were married. Brian and his new wife moved to Schoon in Perth, about 65 miles or 104 kilometres away from where Sheila ran her bed and breakfast, where Brian was a pub landlord. According to the Free Library, in an article in the Scottish Daily Record newspaper in 1999, 30 years after Max was murdered, Brian Tevendale finally broke his silence about his involvement in the murder. He said that Sheila had planted the seed, saying that it would be better if Max was out of the way. He said that he was infatuated with Sheila, thought that he was in love and would have done anything for her. And so the pair started to plot Max's downfall. He went on to say that Sheila had let him and Alan into the farmhouse that night and that Sheila had given him Max's 2-2 rifle. He then admitted that he had then placed a pillow over Max's face and had indeed shot Max once in the head while he lay on his back. He said he regretted it instantly and wished he could change that night, but he was completely under Sheila's spell and knew that he had to see it through. He just wanted to be with Sheila and he thought that was the plan. However, he felt that Sheila had other ideas. Despite the pair living only about 65 miles or 104 kilometres away from each other, they never saw each other again. 
Brian continued to work as a landlord in his pub in Schoon until December 2003, when, at the age of 57, he died of a heart attack, days before he planned to emigrate to Africa for a new life. Trudy and Alfred Burst's marriage was not able to survive the strain, the murder and subsequent court case and revelations about their sex life and involvement in covering up Max's murder had put on it. And so in 1971, three years after the trial, the couple split up, with Alfred getting custody of their three children. Alfred did remarry in 1984, however he died a year later from cancer. Upon Trudy's marriage failing, she began to work as a housekeeper. However, in 1988, she also died of cancer, four years after Alfred. Wendy, Sheila's long-suffering daughter, continued to suffer. She soon realised that her mother would not be able to help her through her torment, her grief, her guilt, leaving her feeling more lost and unloved as ever. Sadly, Wendy's struggle, which had been inflicted upon her by people who should have been protecting and loving her, alienated her from her brother Lloyd and sister Angela, as well as her own daughter, who Wendy had not had contact with since she left her ex-husband. Wendy continued to live in England and did eventually seek counselling and did manage to stabilise her drinking and mental health, eventually gaining employment in a local mental health charity shop. According to the Free Library, in 2001, when Wendy was 45, she reached out to the Daily Record newspaper to tell her side of the story. She said that, I don't have a past and it's difficult to look towards a future. What happened that night has ruined many people's lives, including mine. She went on to say that, it's hard to hold down relationships when you come with as much baggage as I do. I just want to be able to put the past behind me now. However, Wendy felt that the legacy of what happened that night lives on and she doesn't think she will ever be able to escape it. Wendy went on to say that she does forgive her mother. She confirmed also that she would be starting to write a book about the murder, as she felt this was the only way she would be able to work through and deal with the baggage she perceives to carry. Sadly, the book Wendy vowed to write was never forthcoming and Wendy died in 2015 at the age of 59 one year after her mother passed, possibly never having been able to work through the trauma she had experienced. There are so many victims in this story. Clearly Sheila was an abused wife and it was just the time she lived in that dictated that she must stay with her husband, must stay married, stay for the children, despite the torture and torment she was being subjected to by her husband. However much of a brute Max appeared to be, he did not deserve to die. It was clear he had issues with drink and drugs, and he likely had homosexual tendencies, which at that time was illegal. Again, had he been living in today's society, he would have been able to explore those feelings without reprisal. Brian also was a victim. He loved Sheila so much, he would have done anything for her, and he couldn't stand to see her being treated so poorly by Max. Whether it was Sheila who instigated the plan to murder Max, or whether Brian did of his own accord, whether Sheila pulled the trigger or Brian did, will never be known for sure. But what is known is that Brian was infatuated with Sheila and had been manipulated by Max. He too was a victim. However, Wendy was the inadvertent victim, and seems the person who had the most deep-rooted and long-lasting trauma. Like I said, a lot of the details for this episode came from the fantastic podcast The Storyteller Violent Delights by Isla Traquair. It's a 10-episode podcast with additional bonus episodes, and there is so much more information about this case in that podcast that I could not possibly say in this episode. It's so informative with interviews and reenactments of the trial by voice actors. I would highly recommend giving this podcast a listen if you would like to know even more about the life and the love triangle of Max, Sheila and Brian. So that's it. Come back next time for another episode of Scottish Murders. Scottish Murders is a production of Clurin